people are running around chasing productivity hacks and that's because they're lacking infrastructure in play. If you're talking to an athlete, they're not running around looking for diet hacks. They have an infrastructure in play and that will support and allow them to lean into their success. Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the brilliant Chris Ward. Chris Ward is creating a movement where your business supports your life instead of consuming it. Chris is the founder of the Win the Hour, Win the Day philosophy. After the loss of her husband, Chris returned full-time to her work as a marketing strategist. She was relieved that her business had not only survived her absence, but was growing. Now, Chris has completely changed the landscape for entrepreneurs by sharing the successful practices that allowed her absence. Chris has shared the stage with Jack Canfield of Chicken Soup for the Soul, Kevin Harrington of Shark Tank, James Malinchak of Secret Millionaire, Sharon Lecter of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Joe Theismann, the NFL All-Star and commentator, to name a few. Chris has also been featured on award-winning podcasts, radio, and TV shows. Chris herself is an acclaimed podcaster. You can hear her on her own podcast, Win the Hour, Win the Day, where she has engaging conversations with dynamic guests, including me, covering a variety of business topics so you can get on to your next win now. Well, hey, Chris Ward, I got a question for you, which is, what do small business owners need to focus on this week? Oh, I love that question, Annie, because so much people are like, oh, focus, this, discipline, all these things, right? And they just make you crazy. So I guess what I would say to you, here's the thing, focus, whatever word you want to describe it is stop beating yourself up, stop grinding it out, thinking that more hard work is the answer, because if it was, you'd be exactly where you wanted to be by now. Oh, man. Right? Oh, (laughs) man. That is so, like, you're not even a sentence in, and I'm already like, (laughs) but that's so true. I mean, so at point of recording, my birthday was like two days ago. And I was walking around the beautiful Botanic Gardens here in Chicago with my husband, and he asked me what the most important lesson I learned in my 37th year on Earth was. And I said almost exactly what you just said. I said, I equate stress with a faster learning curve in that for the longest time, I have I have conditioned myself that if I am moving at a lightning speed and overthinking and I'm up in a tizzy and I'm losing sleep and I'm, you know, out of whack that somehow that extra effort will convert to faster, bigger, louder success. And it's like, whoa, it hit me like a truck this year. Actually, the more freaking stressed I am the whole time, the longer it's going to take me because I'm creating my own resistance. So Chris, where, where do you think we got this grindstone mentality from? And, and what the heck do we do to unlearn that? Yeah. I remember saying to my mom one day, who knew the hardest thing I'd have to learn is that hard work is like something I shouldn't be proud of, right? Like everywhere you go from a child on, it's like, oh, she's a hard worker. Oh, she's building that business. She's a hard worker. Like that's the biggest compliment you could get, right? So it's been, you know, fed to us in so many different levels. And the thing is, you're so right, Annie. It's very counterproductive. When my clients work with me in the winter circle, they all tell me they get 25 hours back a week within the first month of working with us. But the downside to that is uh, there is a certain amount of calming and coaching that I have to do because if you're not running in hysterical mode, what I used to call hysterical Chris, 
you feel like you're going half speed. Like, okay, yes, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm not working hard enough. Like if I'm still rested and I'm not like, you know, stepping over bodies because I'm going so fast, everyone's so slow. You think, oh no, I'm just not pushing hard enough. I should be doing more. Yes. Yes. And, and I know whenever I streamline something or, you know, I look at things from an essentialist or minimalistic productivity first mindset, there's a lot of grief that I experience letting those other things go or atrophy, including just letting the stress go. I miss it sometimes because I'm like, well, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. No, I'm just looking for more reasons to be stressed because for me, stress feels like future success. That's so messed up. Yeah, you bring up a really good point, Annie. And again, what I would just encourage people to understand is that, listen, if hard work was the answer, you'd be exactly where you wanted to be by now. So that really, you have to repeat that. It's so important because what I want you to understand is this. When you are rested, when you are clear-minded, that's when your creativity is the highest. That's when you problem solve. That's when you can plan. You know, in the history of humankind, the best inventions were done at times of relaxation and play. And that's where our brain power is at its best. And when you are just racing the paces, getting through the day and thinking you're just chopping things off your to-do list, and it's like a you're jumping over hurdles through the whole day, that's survival mode. It's not creation mode. And it's not going to take your business anywhere. Yeah. And and by the time you get a good lead on the hook, you know, you sit down with them and you're a frazzled mess. Yeah. One of my clients just said to me last week in the winter circle, she said, Chris, my time I now spend at, you know, in the office is cut in half. So she said, like, literally I'm working half the hours. And she said, my sales doubled because she's showing up clear-minded, prepared. She's following leads that would have slipped through the cracks on LinkedIn. She's showing up for that meeting ready to go. And her, you know, instead of that whole thing, we all do in hysterical mode, you flying by the seat of our pants, right? You know, you do that, but you have this false sense because it's your business, because you care so much, because you started from the ground up that you can wing it. Sure. You can wing it, but that's, what is that? Was that 40% of your best capability or 30? It's not a hundred. No, it's probably like 12.5%, you know, like, oh, so I love this permission that you're giving us to do less in doing the more essential things. So my considering how most of the world kind of bastardizes the idea of productivity as like, get more done faster. uh, How do you as a productivity, I'm not even going to say expert, I'm going to say queen. As a productivity queen, how do you define it? Well, Annie, that is an excellent question because what I would say is this. People are running around chasing productivity hacks and that's because they're lacking infrastructure in play. If you're talking to an athlete, they're not running around looking for diet hacks. They have an infrastructure in play. And that will support and allow them to lean into their success. So this idea of productivity is a misnomer. It's it's a distraction as you look to fix something that, you know, not only did you, you didn't, it's not broken because you never created it. You never put it in place. You have no infrastructure in your business. Productivity is a distraction. Oh my God. That is freaking brilliant. It's like, The day that I realized that reading books about procrastination was actually a form of procrastination, like fixating on being the most productive you can be may be distracting you from what's actually important and needing to get done. Oh, man. Dang it. Dang it. Because where people are going wrong is they're confusing business growth with scaling their business. Business growth is keeping up to what's happening. And I encourage you, if you hear yourself say, once I get past this next thing, or once we get past this next thing, things will be different. Ding, ding, Mm -hmm. ding, ding. That's a problem. And that's not scaling your business. That is just trying to keep up with the growth. Yep. That's like basically trying to keep up with inflation. 100%. And here's even a, I want you to visualize this. Let's say that you're working... 60 hours a week right now. And you're making, let's do simple math. You're making 10,000 a month. 
First of all, I would say if you're working 60 hours, you're probably working 75 because you're saying, oh, I yeah. come in on Sundays just to get ahead of my emails, but that's not work. I don't count that. And you've all, oh, I have to take this course on Tuesday nights, but that's not work. I don't count that. So I would argue if you think you're working 60 hours, you're working 75. And yeah. let's say you're making 10K a month, but you want to make more money. Of course, that's the nature of business to grow. So you want to make what? 20, 25K. So if mm -hmm. you're working 60 hours now and you're making 10K, do you think you're going to work 30 hours when you're making 25 K? Oh, wouldn't that be great? But also like, I feel like we're in the mentality of like, no, in order to make 30 K, I got to work 120 hours a week. Well, the Never math is working sleep. against you, right? Right. And so that's the whole thing. You think, well, things will be different when I bring in more revenue, but that more revenue is going to bring more work because you are just trying to keep up to the growth. You do not have an infrastructure in play like, yeah you know, systems and processes are super tool credit or what I call our win team, because people often confuse hiring somebody like having a VA and throwing work at them as a team. That's not a team. No, that's and it's a not VA. about the quantity. It's about the setup. Right. Well, I love, so everything in entrepreneurship right now, not everything, not everything, Annie, I got to reel the bitchiness back in. Hold on. I'm taking my fishing reel and I'm reeling back in the bitchiness a whole lot of entrepreneurial content has a giant glowing easy button on it, right? Like here's my swipe file, just send out this exact thing, make a million dollars. Here's my funnel, just copy it. You know, in two days, you'll make a million dollars. Watch my webinar, make a million dollars. Easy, easy, easy. Go on the beach with your laptop, get sand in it. Who cares? Buy a new laptop, right? And I love what you were talking about, about infrastructure versus hacks in that there are ways to reduce a learning curve. There are ways to learn from others and their profitable mistakes and their profitable wins, right? There are ways to learn and be inspired and to be mentored and to be led. But in order for us to grasp onto our own version of success, we have to have a foundation in our business. So many people looking for those easy buttons do not have the platform on which to rest that easy button. And then they go, well, why isn't this working? So they go and try 9,000 other hacks instead of actually planting the garden, sowing the seeds. So how do we, how do we avoid falling for this hack mentality? Well, you bring up a couple of really good points. And I would like to chime in with and say, yes, this lifestyle, lap, uh, living the life laptop lifestyle where you're on the beach. First of all, maybe you have a different computer than me because I can't see the screen, right? And secondly, right, no. if you're on the beach, then enjoy the beach. I don't see that as a, as a desirable thing. You should be enjoying no. the beach. So I don't know where we're going with that, but that's a whole big thing. So it's really interesting to me that you bring up the word sowing the seeds. What I would like you to do is imagine this. Let's say you went out and you said, Annie, okay, I, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to get a house plant. And imagine you've got a house plant in your left hand and you're like, oh, you know, I feel so good. I kept this alive. It's really exciting. It just looks so good. It makes me feel good. I'm going to go out and get another one. And then you think this is going really well. I actually have a natural talent for this. I'm going to get a few more. And then you say, you know what, pun intended, I want to really grow my business. I think I'm going to go from these house plants to taking these plants and making a farm out of it so I can sell at volume, right? And what I encourage you to think about is these three house plants on the, you know, on the left side versus a farm is, yeah. is the infrastructure because you need that infrastructure for the volume of output. But yeah. what happens to so many entrepreneurs is you get one plant and it dies off and you run out to get another and now you're neglecting the two that are doing well because you have to go find a new house plant and you're doing all this stuff and you're just rotating it versus having a structure that can allow for an organized, effective, consistent output of the farm. And so often as entrepreneurs, that's what we're doing. We are chasing, oh, you know, I got really busy. I onboarded these new clients because I don't have systems and processes in play to make this effective. And then, you know, I'm busy with the new client. And then, you know what, then all of a sudden you get busy there and then you lose a client and it's just this constant rotation. So what I would encourage you to think about is this. When you have systems and processes in play, like our super toolkit, you're not relearning things. You're getting constant traction on your success and you're eliminating mistake, mistakes effectively and quickly. Because here's the most powerful thing. If nobody listens to anything else I say, this is really important. Lean in, y'all. All right, lean in.
you may have competitors that are not as good at what you do and don't even care half as much as you do about what you do. But if they can get their ideas to execution consistently and effectively, that's the name of the game. They're going to get your clients because they're constantly getting their ideas to execution, ideas to execution. They're having a bigger and bigger impact on the niche market because they're consistent with that. Where you're running around trying to keep up with busy work, admin work, and new work, then you have just created a very expensive job and you're not getting it out there. One billion trillion zillion bajillion percent agree right in sales landia where i hang out all day i tell people all the time if you're not asking for business with regularity you are basically putting your prospects in the hands of people who care less than you right and so i love what you're saying if they're not executing to completion if they're not completing if they're not executing by that y'all chris means asking marketing and selling in tandem, putting yourself out there, getting visible, being consistent, being loud about your value, asking for the sale and then delivering on that value. That is completion. Every Mm -hmm. single step. 100%. And having a process that you can say, well, you know what? This works. Okay, great. Or this didn't work last time. Okay, let's tweak that. Because we're always talking Mm -hmm. about our super toolkits where we call it queuing it, C-U-E, create, use, and edit. And people confuse those with standard operating procedures. And those are written by the end user. Usually they're static in nature. They're just there to cover liability. And we've seen that as employees when we had our jobs. And so then you think that these SOPs are going to stifle your creativity in your business. And they probably would. That's why we created super toolkits. Because what you want to be is an execution mode 60% of the time. You want to be getting your ideas to execution. The admin work should constantly be compressed. Oh, oh, okay. So anybody out there, did y'all hear what she just said about structure versus creativity? They are pals, right? They are pals. They are buddies. We were just talking on the show a couple of weeks ago about creativity in constraint, right? We use the block of marble. We are limited to the block of marble, but we are freed by the block of marble when we're sculpting, right? So anybody out there who's going, ugh, structure, ugh, infrastructure, ugh, processes, ugh, SOPs, guess what? We cannot eliminate managerial or process waste until we look at our processes and cement them. It's just not possible. So we got to earn the ability to create by having that firm foundation. So you said, what was it? Create, use, utilize, create, use, edit. Create, use, and edit. Which you bring up a really good point, Annie, is this. People think that... Small business owners, entrepreneurs think that uh, systems and processes can restrict you. But I want you to understand this. When you're flying all over the place, even just going to your email or most people do first thing in the morning, what happens is you're going, your brain's going in all different directions. Every email has a different thing and you're looking at it from fear base. Oh, is this problem? Mm -hmm. Is this problem? What happens right off the bat is decision fatigue. So that's the first thing is you wear down your decision fatigue. I'm glad you're talking about this. Keep going. And the second thing, also very important, and most people don't talk about it all, is attention residue. And I want you to imagine like taking shaving cream and putting it against the wall and then wiping it off. It doesn't all come off the wall. That's your attention residue. When you pop in and out of things, you are leaving attention residue behind. You are not coming back with all the attention you left with. Oh my God. Can we please... Just, I got to ring the bell. Hold on. Can we just talk about these two so powerful concepts you just dropped so lovingly into our laps? Decision fatigue. I mean, I got fatigued just thinking about all the times I've had decision fatigue. And attention residue. Oh my heck. A lot of people that listen to this show uh, identify as somehow neurodivergent, a lot of ADHD, a lot of ADD, I have OCD. Uh, A lot of people are maybe they're just easily distracted, as my friend Amber Holly calls it, right? Like all of these different things. But the idea of attention residue, how completely 
True. My friend Amber, who I was talking about with this idea of, you know, easy, easy distraction, she said to me yesterday, if you don't hurry up and send that email, you're not going to get anything else done. And it's because of that residue. There was a film of that action distraction sitting on everything I did in the back of my head. So I couldn't be fully present, but I never thought of it before as such a perfect phrase, attention residue. Well, yeah, it's it's science, not even a phrase. And I think what you're saying is so very important because think about this. Restaurants have a higher sales per table when they have less items on their menu. So yes. if you're going to dinner and you're having a wonderful evening and it's carefree and you still get a, a, you know, a decision fatigue from a menu, imagine when you're hopping in and out and making all these financial decisions and reacting to your day. You don't think that's times a hundred more powerful. So you're wearing your battery down with decision fatigue. Oh my goodness. Yes. And we also wear our prospects down with decision fatigue when we try to solve every problem for every prospect, right? So if I come to your website and it's like, you know, you've got the winner circle. You mentioned that a couple of times, but if I come to your website and it's like winner circle, retreats, one-on-ones, group. Yeah. Big group, yeah. little group, loud group, yeah. live group, mastermind, workshop, affiliates, right? Like yeah. if I see every single possible offering, it is no different than going into the cereal aisle and being like, do I want Cocoa Puffs, Cocoa Krispies, or Count Chocula? I don't yeah. know. Or the dollar store brand. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I want. I came in for a chocolate cereal because I had a weird craving and now I'm leaving with 19 of them because I couldn't pick one and I spent way more than I intended to. And now I don't even want the dang chocolate cereal because I got so stressed trying to pick one. And why do we have to have so many kinds of cereal? Do not do that to your prospects on your website in your offering. We do that with niches too, where people are like, well, I don't want to niche down too small. So instead I'll just be, I'll, I'll try to facilitate these like, disparate 12 extremely specific niches. Like I work with like a flea food. market. Right. It's yeah. like, y'all calm down. We do not need to be the human equivalent of Walmart. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I would say too, that when you have systems and processes in play, not only does it protect your brain power, but then you can go and deal with the stuff you need to get done. And it leaves you, your brain fresh and mm -hmm. free than to go on and create. So you don't have to, we, mm -hmm. businesses should not be run in memory, but you're not using brain power, remembering something, you're not relearning things. Something that happens to me a fair bit is somebody will say to me, this happened just recently, they'll say, Chris, you, you know, we just recently got into TikTok. Chris, I just got into TikTok too. And they're like, you seem to be making more traction than me. It's because we have a super toolkit. So every day we look at what works and we eliminate stuff that isn't. And we're not going, oh yeah, I remember we tried that two weeks ago and it didn't work. We're building on our strengths every day. We're not relearning things. The whole team's on board. So we just really built a blueprint out very quickly. And so we can get our ideas to execution faster than somebody else because we don't have the constant learning and relearning curves that they're pained with. Right. It's experimentation with like a lab environment built into it. But yeah. I love that the yeah. metric and, and the, the data that you're looking for is the best practices and what to double down on. Right. Yeah. Because I think so often as a professional strategist, people come to me with a problem and they want to rush to tackling and solving the problem. But I'm constantly illuminating the fact, which seems so obvious to me now at this point in my business, is that the way that we solve problems seven, eight times out of 10 is to double down on what's working. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're eliminating waste by focusing on what's actually working, that right there is how we start to get that time back, that energy back and eliminate a lot of that overhead waste. So I just freaking love that. And I love that phrase, fresh and free. Mm -hmm. You should be starting your day refreshed and leaving fresh. Your mm. business should support your life, not consume it. And business should be fun. Or why did we leave that job that we didn't like? Right. Why did I give up a 401k if I'm not going to have a good time? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why anybody yeah. would, right? But I love the idea of fresh and free. Come in refreshed and leave feeling fresh again. Freaking love that. Yeah. I love that.
Well, speaking of someone fresh and uh, single, if not free, uh, you have come today to talk about a Brad Pitt movie, which I think is the first, imagine this, first Brad Pitt mention on all of TLTQ, which I feel like we should just celebrate that. In an oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but cause like, you know, I've loved him since Tristan in Legends of the Fall. How could you not? Um, but Chris, you came here today to talk about a movie near and dear to a lot of strategists hearts just because it's such a nerdy, good movie. Uh, what the heck does any of this have to do with Moneyball? Well, you know what? If I can, before you jump into there, I just want to unpack one more little thing that you said, cause I think yes. it was so important and I didn't uh, jump on it was this. So many entrepreneurs come to me and they think they've got ADD, ADHD, and maybe they all are diagnosed with that. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you that if you didn't have it when you started your own business, I think the business would give you those symptoms. So I recently <laughs> I recently wrote a blog saying, you know, all entrepreneurs with ADHD stop and read this. So I would also just yep. want to point out that those things are just the outcome of you running around in chaos and hysterical mode, what I yes. call a recovering <sighs> rushaholic, trying to get it all done and blaming it on yet another symptom because that's my pain in life is when people are running around saying, oh, it's a mindset thing. Oh, it's my ADHD. It's all these things. No, you are in survival mode and you're constantly just trying to keep up and it's creating these symptoms, but they're the fallout of a lack of structure. And again, the structure is freeing. It's your structure you can create so it elevates and accelerates your growth. It's not something imposed by a dry corporation that's going to bog you down. So my apologies. I had to, I had to slide that in. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. There is no need to apologize when you drop the term recovering Russiaholic. If you put that on a T-shirt, I would wear okay, it. That's... If you put that on a sweatshirt, I would wear it. If you put that on a tiara, I would wear I it. I should patent like, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Patch it, like, patent it and merch it out, baby, yeah. because that is so relatable, right? I'm, I'm addicted to stress. I'm addicted to hustle. I'm addicted to rushing. How liberating to say I'm a recovering rushaholic. I can slow down and be just as successful, if not more. I can work less and win more. Yeah. I can win more hours. I can win more days, yeah. to use your language. Oh! recovering Russia holic. I need a shirt. Okay. I need a shirt. We, By the end we of the may week, have to make Brad. one of those now, but on to more important <laughs> things like Brad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Mr. Pitt. Yes. I love Moneyball, And I, I remember watching it the first time and I'm a sucker for anything that shows the machinery of business. And I just felt that movie yeah. really falls into what we do as entrepreneurs, where you just think, oh, you know, if you if you've seen the movie, there's the, one of my favorite scenes. They're sitting around the table and they're looking at the different guys that they're going to bring on next year, and all the uh, uh, recruiters are saying, well, this guy's got swagger and confidence, so he'll be good at bat. And it was just all these arbitrary things. And then yet what mm -hmm. it comes down to is they had a, a new uh, way of looking at the numbers. And this was based on a true story in a book and stuff. And it was really about, never mind the swagger and the confidence and is he good looking? It was like, you know, how many times can we walk him to bat? Well, we want them to hit home runs. Well, mm -hmm. let's get, you can't get a home run if you don't get to first, right? So it was right. taking the whole industry and looking at it from a logistical numbers point of view and constantly crunching and pushing the numbers in what, as they describe, is sort of a land of misfit players, but putting them together, yes. making the numbers made efficiency. Whereas too often we just look at something and say, well, everyone says this is the new thing and they look like they're wearing you know, a cool outfit or they're successful or their website seems to be pretty. I'll follow that path. Mm -hmm. And that's what I loved about the movie. Mm. Oh my God. Okay. Well, so many things. What The thing I loved about Moneyball is, A, I just love numbers and math, right? So when they're yeah. looking at all like the stats and they're going, okay, well, if we do this and our percentage of this, and I was just like, oh, give me more of this, please. Um, but, you know, what I loved about it is the, the ragtag band of like B, C, and D list player yeah. trope 
is everywhere, right? Mighty Ducks, Major League, Police Academy, even like it doesn't even have to be a sports movie, but like we are coming together and nobody wants us, but together we will succeed because we understand how it works and we care about each other, right? Like, and and so I love that, but I think what Moneyball does is it explains why that works because they're not looking only at the flashiest stats in the room, right? They're looking at true metrics, not just vanity metrics. Mm. And so I love this idea of like, exactly to your point, you cannot win a baseball game without runs. If you put a million Mark McGuire's on the plate, you're not going to win the game because Mark McGuire hits really gorgeous home runs about once every five innings back in the yeah. day, right? I'm a St. Yeah, Louis yeah, girl, yeah. so I'm going to like date my references here. But, you know, we wouldn't have won. You got to get your single hitters. You got to have your old reliables. You got to have your processes and your infrastructure. You have to have not only good pitching, but good shortstops who can get shit done, right? So I love that idea, but I love the way that you're tying it to this idea of let's not look at just the most swagger, Let's go deeper than swagger and look at what? What are we looking at when we can strip away all that swagger? Well, you know, it reminds me of something that I find very powerful is you could take a snowflake and it could be in the palm of your hand and it melts within seconds. And yet you get enough of those snowflakes together and in a very short period of time, it can shut down a city. And to me, that's yeah. about building on success. Like that's the infrastructure there, like boom, 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 boom. The consistency mm -hmm. of the snowflakes, the city shut down. And so often we run in different directions all over the place. And that's one of the things that we're tying into here is that infrastructure can just build that consistency really effectively. And whatever the goal is, if the snowflakes goal is to shut down the city, you can do that by the consistency of building upon each other. Well, and I love that because consistency is reliability. Yeah. Right? When we look at something like sports, there's two kinds of pitch hitters, right? There's two kinds of pitch hitters. There's the ones that come in when they're like, we need to bring in our number one because this game is boring as hell. To bring up my beloved Cardinals yet again, like last week, they let freaking Pujols pitch because we were up by like 16 runs. And so they were like, sure, let's just have our celebrity batter come out and pitch, right? That is a publicity stunt for a boring game. But most of the time, if you're bringing in a relief, you know it's somebody who has a high rate of delivery, not a high rate of showmanship a high rate of delivery. We're looking for reliability. We need to turn something around. We got to go with the person who has the highest percentage of filling the need, right? And so I love that idea as a benchmark for us as business owners too, is maybe we don't have all the swagger, but damn, if we don't have consistency, right? And so when people are looking for stuff, they are looking at stuff like, how often are you innovating? How consistent are you posting? Are you practicing what you preach? We all have, you know, cobbler has no shoe moments, but are you working your plan? Am I selling as often as I say I'm selling, right? Are we showing up? Because they see that too, right? Yeah. I mean, the whole name of the game with that movie was, you know, you got to get them the first to get them to second. And, you know, so it's like, yeah. well, you, whatever he's one guy says, you, you pay me to, I want you to walk. He says, you pay me to hit. And he says, no, I pay you to get home. Right. Or I steal bases. Mm -hmm. No, I pay you to get home, get whatever you have to do mm -hmm. to get home. If it's one bat, one base at a time versus hitting a home run, doesn't matter. It's flashy. We're looking for the numbers, right? How do we get, you, yes. how do we get those numbers up? So it's, again, having consistency, staying with the plan, saying this is the infrastructure. Here's how we're going to get from A to B. And don't change that every day of the week because you're stressed out or you're as a recovering rushaholic trying to get something faster. You need to slow down to speed up. Stealing a base is a gimmick. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's important. Yeah. It, it can turn games around, but at the end of the day... If you're stealing a base, you're probably showboating yeah, more than trying yeah. to advance the score. Yeah. Like, we could just be real about that, right? But I love that idea of, like, no, I pay you to get home. Yeah. Your job is to get home, right? Yeah. And so 
you know, I always am having to talk about stuff like fake urgency and fake scarcity and these selling gimmicks. And the thing is, yes, a gimmick will work sometimes pretty decently well, but people also catch wise to gimmicks really quickly and put more pressure on something that was gimmick sold to them because they're like, all right, you got me. You better deliver now. Right. And so a lot of the time I feel like when we're doing these urgency scarcity plays, when we're doing manipulative tear down selling, whatever that is, we're stealing a base instead of focusing on how we can advance. And I love that. That's really profoundly like striking a chord with me about not doing the flashiest thing when what we can do is the foundational pieces that will set us up for long-term success. Yeah. And I think to your point, Annie, and there's another point, another scene in the movie where he's teaching the other guy how to fire somebody and he's going on and on. Oh, he said, listen, God. you want to get shot once, you know, once in the head or four times in the gut, like just tell them yeah. that's it. And yeah. so the effectiveness in communication, which is supported by super toolkits and the effectiveness in sales that's a really good point there is like, get to it. Tell him he's fired and he's, you know, he's been traded, not fired and move on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of us who have been in business for longer than a week will tell you that the quick no is infinitely better than the long maybe. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. It's just like, I don't, none of, even though, especially if we're trying to be more efficient, none of us have time to sit there with somebody going, But we keep them, but what we don't realize is we can keep them in that place of indecision by doing the same thing where they're like, well, what are your prices? Well, for you, you're a referral and I like you and da, da, da. like we're keeping them in that slow pace. Y'all yeah. rip it off like a bandaid price. It ain't nothing but a number. Say the number, move on with your life. You've got to fire someone, rip off the bandaid. It sucks. It's part of business. Get it done. Move on to the next thing. Let's go. So how can we as managers, as leaders, as founders, as providers, how can we be productive and team players at the same time? How can we foster a culture of winning the hour and winning the day? That is a really interesting word because people do not talk about culture at all, and I bring it up all the time, saying that we have this false uh, sense that a culture is connected to a larger organization. And I mm -hmm. would argue a culture is so much more important with a smaller group. And I would ask mm -hmm. you to visualize, let's say you're on an ocean liner and there's 500 people on that boat and something happens. You want a certain percentage of those people to be helpful, right? To get you out right. of that sticky situation. Yeah. However, in a rowboat, if there's three of you, you better really have a strong team because yeah. there's a hole in the boat and you need everybody in that boat to get you out of that situation. So I would tell you a big part of what we do with creating a win team is making that culture so powerful that really it's like, it just, oh, it's just magic and it takes care of itself because my, what we really lean into is your team should manage you, you not manage them. Oh my God. That is the dream. Right. My it's a dream. My, it's very doable. <laughs> oh, so good. My assistant calls herself my chaos coordinator. And that is a hundred percent true because she does manage me. Yeah. She does. Yeah. She totally does. And she'll send me a text at like like I'm sure I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna get a howler, Mrs. Weasley style, being like, Your spreadsheet's not updated. Thank you, Liz. I know I will get to it as soon as I can. Right. But that is so totally, totally true. So when you are bringing on people to your baseball team or your business team and you want to do it the money ball way, when you want to look at consistency, reliability, full person, not just the swagger, what kind of uh, questions do you ask and what kind of qualities do you look for to be a part of Team Chris? Well, we use what I created called the PASS formula, personality, action, uh, skill set, and strengths. And so we always mm. hire personality over skill set. Mm. I put them through a series of little micro actions through the interview process and they eliminate themselves by not completing them. Even something as simple as something silly in the subject line. Like when you reply mm -hmm. to this job, 
key in the word sunshine. If I don't see that yep. in the subject line, it's just eliminated. They didn't follow instructions, right? Well, they didn't and follow then, instructions, which means they didn't really read the email. Yeah, and so. then you don't want them working for you because you want somebody that has got a keen eye for detail. Yep. And then another thing too is I often ask people, what's the success for them? And that's really mm. telling what somebody defines a success. I don't care what the success oh. is, but their vision of that success and how they articulate that success is really telling of their personality. Oh, my God. And then, of course, there's always asking their strengths, which they should be able to articulate by now because that's just a, a given in a job interview. I'm looking for confidence. I'm looking for articulation. And they should be able to answer that question by now. But the success mm -hmm. one is very telling. Heck yes. So let us all, as a people, band together to eliminate stress worshiping and unnecessary humility in bragging situations right? We want to know your skills, y'all. Your prospects want to know. Your partners want to know. Your future affiliates want to know. The platforms want to know. The media wants to know. It's not about being a jerk, y'all. If you're great, we need to know that. Amen. And it's not about swagger. It's about freaking consistency. Chris, this has been such a wonderful, refreshing, uplifting actionable call. I got two more questions for you. Okay. If you were to go out and buy a sports team tomorrow, what sport would you buy a team in and what would you name that team? Well, this might surprise you, but I am up to my eyeballs in Formula One. I just discovered that a year ago because of the Netflix series. And now I'm all about that. I just, my whole <laughs> life is a build it. So I would definitely get a Formula One team, even though it's like the most expensive team on earth. Um, all right. And we would stick the win name in there somewhere because why not for a sports team? I don't think that would be a deficit. So we would figure that out. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. And now I could just see like your book on the side of like a Lamborghini. Like, wouldn't that be yes, so wonderful? Yes. I love it. All right, Chris. So if our listeners want to be part of Team Chris or they need you on their team uh, or they just want to talk about Formula One, what's the best way for them to start a conversation with you and come into your world? Yeah, well, you know what? First of all, tell me that you heard me on this fantastic podcast and we'll become fast friends. Hey. Um, I do have a free gift. If you go to www.freegift, G-I-F-T, from Chris, K-R-I-S dot com, free gift from Chris dot com. Oh I have put God. some special things in there just for your listeners. Something that we still charge for a lot. It's a free version of my audio book. So you might want to get it. It's temporary. Uh, but it's up there for now, the free version of my audio book. Uh, so you can chime in there or find me on any of the socials, especially LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, and I'd love to hear your takeaway from this show. So please let me know. I've been kicking around this really goofy idea of just giving superfluous awards away. So um, for the first time on a TLTQ episode, Chris Ward, for the gift and joy that is free gift from Chris.com. Uh, the amazing domain award goes to Chris Ward for free gift from Chris.com. I mean, you can't get better than that, people. You just can't. So, Chris, thank you so much for that gift and the gift of your presence in your brain today. It's been such an honor getting to have you here. Thank you so much, Annie. I appreciate you. And we will definitely be staying connected. Everybody, I will be back in just a second with my final thought and your homework for this week. Well, hey there. As I mentioned in this episode, I love absolutely anything about underdogs and misfits. Uh, honestly, it feels so relatable to watch someone get underestimated and pretty darn fabulous to watch them exceed all expectations. But when is the last time we actually let someone exceed our expectations? Understandably, strategically, we have a tendency to shop for peers, partners, and advisors at our current level of success or above. We assign bonus points for large networks, shiny social media presences, and name recognition. And again, we're not wrong to do so. Like I said, this is highly strategic behavior, but it doesn't often feel all that great. 
this week, we are going to do the exact opposite of your homework just a few weeks ago, which was Russell Brunson's Dream 100, which is putting ourselves directly in the pathway of both our heroes and their groupies. But nope, this week we are going to moneyball it. Remember, the moneyball method is looking for underutilized, under the radar, less flashy, but more reliable team players. Who is an up and comer in your space? Maybe a completely untested rookie with wonderful instincts, or maybe they're not an up and comer. Maybe they're a glorious, reliable has been, a retiree unexpectedly re entering the workforce, overlooked even though they are a walking treasure trove of best practices, or a stay at home parent re entering a new career whose skills may be a bit rusty, but who has more transferable skills than a master's program. Identify one potential partner using this modified Moneyball method and share your platform with them, not as an act of charity, but as a pure collaboration of equals. You just might discover someone marvelous. You might make a new best friend and you'll very possibly make some money in the process, either directly or indirectly. But this week, we're bonding with the folks behind the big shots, because while everyone is clamoring for their attention all the time, we know there's plenty of room near the top for all of us. Hey, thanks for listening. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the non sleazy Sales Academy and me, your host, Annie P. Ruggles. Listen, we talk a lot about marketing on this show, and that's because I fully earnestly believe that every dime and every moment we spend marketing is totally worth it unless we turn around and sabotage ourselves at the finish by refusing to sell and sell beautifully. Why? A lot of us have a misconception of what selling actually requires of us or who it needs us to be. Please give me the opportunity to help change your mind at www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y.com. Big shout out to the fabulous dudes who helped make this show what it is. My producer and editor, Andrew Sims of Hypable Impact. My composer, Riley Herbastio and my show artist, Francois Vigneault. They're all fabulous, and I'd be glad to introduce you. Until next week, just do your best, and remember, you're too legitimate to quit. <laughs>